Hi, my name is Daniel Galishan. I'm a physicist, and I'm here to tell you how I can read your mind. Now, I originally put this together as a 10-minute talk before a live audience, but for YouTube, I'm going to speak a bit faster. You can always repeat a bit if I talk too fast. Now, some of you watching this may not have enjoyed physics at school. You may not know any physicists personally. You may not even know what a physicist looks like. Well, don't worry. I've done your research for you. I asked Google, and this is what I found as the first image. Interestingly, though, this was the second image. I like to think that I'm more of a compromise between the two, and I promise you these really were the first two images which came up when I first put this together. So we've established that I'm a physicist, but what about reading your mind? Well, although it may disappoint some of you, I don't mean like this, but more like this. You use some clever machine to look inside the brain and see which bits light up and stuff. And this clever machine is called an MRI, or Magnetic Resonance Imaging. So what is MRI, how does it work, and how can it read my mind, or in this case, how could I use it to read your mind? Well, you start with a big magnet, not so much like this, but more like this. You lie on the table here, it drives you inside, and then the magic happens. And I want to talk a bit more about that magic. 70% of our body is made up of water, and if you zoom down inside water, you find the water molecule, made up of two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen. And if you put the water molecule in a strong magnetic field, the hydrogen nuclei start to act like little magnets and align themselves with the magnetic field. They also begin to resonate at radio frequencies. Importantly, the frequency that they resonate at is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. So the stronger the magnetic field, the higher the frequency. So now we know that we can measure a radio frequency signal from our drop of water. But what if we had more than one drop of water? How can we distinguish between them? Well, to do that, we create a magnetic field gradient field is stronger on the right side than on the left, which of course means that the resonant frequencies on the right are higher than on the left. So the first drop might, for example, be listening to big FM, the second to jazz FM, and the third to classic FM. So then we could measure the signals that we get at each of these frequencies, and we would see that we only get a small signal from big FM because there's a small water drop listening to it, and we get a big signal from jazz FM because of the big drop listening to it. So now we understand the principle, what happens if we try to image a more realistic object? Now, that was actually supposed to be a joke, but on YouTube I can't hear whether or not you found it funny, but this shape does actually help to explain the principle. We can imagine lots of tiny radio stations positioned at all the frequencies across the glass, from the right across to the left, and then we measure the signal that each one gives us, and this will then tell us how much water is sitting at each frequency, which then gives a one-dimensional profile of our object. The signal is stronger where the glass is wider. So this is a good start. We've got a profile of our object, but let's face it, we wanted an image. So we've put our somewhat more realistic object this time into our magnetic field gradient, and we would like to see an image of it. So we take our gradient and we rotate it. And then we get another profile of our object, but in a different direction. And we can keep rotating it and getting different profiles of our object. And when you lie in an MRI scanner and you hear it making funny noises, I don't know if you know what it sounds like, but it kind of goes a bit like burp, 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 burp. And it's because of these gradients rotating. They don't physically spin around, but switching the currents in the wires, which makes the gradients very quickly, is enough to make this noise. And if we put all these profiles together in the right way, we can turn it into an image. And this is a picture of a brain my brain actually, and these are also images of my brain, and if I click on them they even move, which is very important because it looks so much cooler. But with MRI you don't just have to look at the brain tissue, the grey matter and the white matter, you can also use it to look at the blood vessels for example, and these are the arteries in part of my brain. And you can see all of this just because I got an MRI scanner for 20 minutes or so, and I'm just going to pause a little bit here because this animation is particularly cool and I think you should see it for a little bit longer. Okay, that's enough, let's carry on. Now, of course, you don't have to just look at the brain with MRI, you can also use it to look at other parts of the body, and I should say to start that this is, is not me, but this image is taken from a paper that won an Ig Nobel Prize about 10 years ago, and no, that's not the same as a Nobel Prize. Google it if you've never heard of Ig Nobel, it's definitely worth it. Anyway, in case you're still slightly confused as to what exactly you're looking at here, hopefully this will help. And they were also able to reach the strikingly scientific conclusion that the penis during intercourse, in the missionary position at least, has the shape of a boomerang. And in case you were wondering, yes, this research was done in the Netherlands. So that explains MRI, but what about the mind-reading part? 
Well, if we look at a brain, as we've already seen, it's fed by various blood vessels. And if we look more closely at one of these blood vessels, we see that one of the things floating around there are the red blood cells. And if you're anything like me, though, red blood cells are a bit more familiar when they look like this. And you can see that these chaps are the ones which carry oxygen around the body. And what's important for MRI is that when they are carrying oxygen, their oxyhemoglobin, they have a slightly different magnetic field to when they don't have any oxygen or deoxyhemoglobin. This means that if you start using a particular part of your brain for thinking about something, you will change the local concentrations of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin in your blood, and you'll be able to see this as a signal change on an MRI scan. However, a full 3D structural scan like this one takes about five minutes, so it's not really practical to acquire an image like this, then try thinking about something else, then take another image and look for the difference. Instead, we can acquire a much lower resolution image of the brain. In fact, this image for the whole brain takes just three seconds. So we can then repeat the scan lots of times while we're thinking about different things and look for the signal changes. But although this movie is actually running, you probably can't see much in the way of signal change, and that's because the signal doesn't really change very much. It helps if instead we look at how the signal changes over time at different points in the brain. So we can look at these curves, and each different colored curve represents the signal at different colored positions here in the brain over four and a half minutes of this scan. And we look at these curves, and well, to be honest, it's not really helping that much so far, but it does help if we add a little bit more information. On the right here are the same curves as shown in the middle, but overlaid are four different shaded regions, showing the times when the person lying in the scanner was doing something in particular. And it's also useful to know, of course, what the person was doing. So during the blue period, they were looking at this, and this is something designed to stimulate the right side of the visual field. And during the red periods, they were looking at this to stimulate the left side of the visual field. So looking at these signals again, we can almost convince ourselves that here the red curve is actually responding to the red stimulus, and the green curve is responding to the blue stimulus. But if we put all of these signals into an algorithm which looks for changes which are, statistically speaking, related to our stimulus, then we can see this as nicely colored blobs on a brain. So what we're seeing here is that the region of the brain which deals with visual stimuli, looking at stuff, is back here in a region which is referred to as the visual cortex. And we're also able to see more. We can see that it's actually the left side of the brain which is dealing with things we see to our right, and the right side of our brain which is dealing with things from our left. The brain is wired up a bit funny in that way. And of course, we can use this kind of MRI, functional MRI, to look at things way beyond flashing chessboards. People interested in language can design experiments where you can see the different activation patterns associated with thinking about nouns versus thinking about verbs. You can see different patterns associated with the emotions of looking at happy or sad photos. People use it to look at patterns of activation associated with pain and see how these patterns change with pain-killing drugs, then use this information to better understand how the painkillers work. A recent study was even conducted on patients in a vegetative state. They were thought to be completely unconscious and unable to respond to any questions. In the MRI scanner, however, some of them were. They were asked to think about playing tennis to answer yes to a question, or to imagine moving around the rooms in your house to answer no to a question. Now, functional MRI doesn't tell you what the house looks like, but the different patterns of brain activation associated with such different mental tasks are so distinct that they can also be used to answer questions just by thinking. So I may not be able to tell what you're thinking, but I can tell where you're thinking, which is why I'm a physicist, and I can read your mind. Thanks very much for watching, and if you're interested in finding out more, it's a good place to start on Wikipedia. There's lots of links to all kinds of stuff on there.